And I, you know, want to just give you a, just a real brief history of me and, and where I've worked and then kind of relate it to this value soft, value um, source software so that you can kind of see the journey I've taken with it. And it's been a long time. I have a good relationship with uh, all the guys that, and uh, all the people at value source. And, and there's a reason for it is because I, I really like the software and it works really well in my practice. But I want to give you a, a little perspective on it um, so that maybe I can relate to you at a different kind of level, whether that's a, as a sole practitioner or, or as a person in a firm with multiple offices and that kind of thing. You know, initially I started out getting into, to, you know, kind of fraud work and valuation work in 1999. I was certified as a newly minted CVA in 2003. And I had my own firm, and, and I did that for about 11 years and, and started to, to use the software shortly after listening to the pitch in 2003. And, um, and I really liked it, and, and I, I thought it saved me a lot of time, and we'll, we'll go through that um, during this session. But I uh, started using it then, started understanding how, how it would work, and, um, you know, after... I think it was in 2010, I went to work for a regional um, uh, accounting firm called Schneider Downs. And uh, then, uh, you know, so I went from having just one or two or three people in the office to having um, probably 100 people in the office. And uh, so from there, when I went to 100 people in the office, it was a little different and, and it was a different environment, but I still continued to use the software and we, we, we caught on and we used it a bit there. And then in 2014, I went to work for a firm called RGL Forensics. And with RGL Forensics, we went from, you know, five or 10 people in the valuation group to, to a group of 250 people in uh, consulting. And, and again, I've continued to use the software during that period of time. And now our jail forensics was gobbled up by a firm called Baker Tilly, which is, you know, on or about the 11th or 12th largest accounting firm in the country with over 4,200 people. And I continue to, to use the software and it's adapted and, 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 and uh, helped me quite a bit. And so I think that I, I, can give you kind of a unique perspective from someone who has used this in a in a small shop type of environment where I didn't do a lot of valuations to be honest. I did a few a year and I enjoyed the work and and I continued to, to build on that practice and, and I continued to do more and more and more of those valuations to someone that now, you know, we have a full dedicated business valuation staff with multiple people and multiple offices all over the world. And um you know, we haven't rolled it out across the whole firm, but uh, that's because they're not familiar with the software and they haven't used it before. And they're kind of looking at me and our group since we're kind of newly acquired and letting us do our own thing. And then they're going to try to pick up kind of the nice pieces that they like uh, with the processes that we use. And, and uh, the value source will be one of those as we start to try to standardize um, the application of providing business valuations to our clients you know, and capitalize that on that. So that'll be one of the things that we do. So with that, what I want to do is kind of walk you through um, some of the software. And then I want to talk about kind of the practical way and the evolution of my processes, including how I started doing valuations and what I did and kind of the issues and the pitfalls that I had with that. And then from there, move on to, to kind of the software itself and just show you some of the neat stuff that it does um, so that you can understand the benefits and kind of decide for your, yourself whether or not it's it's uh, something you want to try or use. So, so with that, whenever you're doing a business valuation, you're going to have to do it in Excel and Word. Or pretty much, I, I know of hard, very, very few people that use anything other than Excel and Word. And so what you do is, and what I did is, and what I assume most people do, is you take a, a report that you like that someone else wrote and you 
pull the pieces out of that report that you liked and Hello? I can't I, I didn't wasn't sure if there was a question or someone was stopping there was just background noise but I'm going to continue um, so so we generally start with Excel and Word and and we pull pieces of reports that we like we pull, pull boilerplate language from places like Revenue Ruling 5960 that we like and we cite that, of course, properly, and then we make the other language our own, and we start to cobble together a better report, you know, over a longer period of time that has certain certain information that's boilerplate, it has certain information that's custom, and then you have to build in Excel into the Word uh, document, or as we probably do or, or started to do, I started taking that piece out and started really building the schedules in the back and kind of leaving the word portion in the front um, and, and building reports that way. Um, with again, an emphasis on understanding what is boilerplate requirements that meet the, the NACVA and IRS and AICPA types of standards for report writing. So that's a key function. You don't want to have a technical error for failing to consider something uh, or failing to talk about something. So you have that particular issue. And uh, in addition to that, you know, you want to make sure that you're technically correct, that you don't have any math errors. So anybody that's done this for a long time understands that math errors do happen. And, you know, you want to try to eliminate that as much as possible. And, and in a, especially if you're in a small firm or by yourself, you know, unless you're employing an outside service or uh, using someone else to look over your shoulder and check your math, you know, you have that 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 uh, possibility out there, and you actually have that possibility for error at a much higher rate because, again, you don't have anybody looking over your shoulder or checking your work. You know, when I was by myself, I didn't have anybody to look over my shoulder or check my work or see what it is that that. Um, I had done to make sure that the math was correct. You know, where I am now, of course, I have the benefit of that, and I'm the person that checks the work too. So, so we always have a second partner review every single thing that we do and just make sure that, you know, all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed, et cetera. Well, you don't really, you don't really have that uh, when you're by yourself or in a small shop, or especially if you're working with, with people that um, that do something different than what you do. You know, maybe the other partners in your firm or other people in your firm or managers or staff, maybe they do tax accounting or maybe there are auditors. And, you know, it's a little different. It's a little different animal because they don't know exactly where to check to make sure that there aren't any errors. And, and that's a big deal. You know, you can make an error once and uh, lose a client when you make a mistake. I mean, I, I can remember the other day I had someone tell me, a staffer tell me that, um, something had done that we, we had looked at 50,000 transactions and instead we'd actually looked at, and this is a different case on a fraud case, we'd actually looked at 500,000 transactions. And so, you know, misplacing a zero can cause quite a bit of problems in, um, in cases uh, when you don't have the proper supervision or support to, to really to look things over. And so mathematical mistakes are, are just very detrimental. You, you just don't want to have those. So how do you, how do you, how does this, this software evolve? Well, it evolved in the same way as, and along the same lines as to what it is I'm talking about. I mean, people were using Excel and Word and they're having these issues talking about errors and trying to get this to, to be a little more of a seamless process and then have it work a little more together. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples. One is, you know, a client may change their mind and on a gift tax um, valuation. And let's say they don't want to gift, you know, 20 percent. Then they change their mind. They're only gifting 17 percent. And in theory, the client thinks, well, that should just be a pretty easy change. Well, it's not an easy change in, in Excel and Word because you have to go down and hunt down every single place and every single instance and every single calculation as it relates to that. And so you have to go through and, and find all those things. So, so you know, it's 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 a problem. And this software it automates that process. I'll just give you a preview. It automates that process, and you can click a button, change it to 17. It knows where all the instances are, 
and you can go from there and um, um, have kind of one place to seamlessly change things. So, so, so we have those issues. The second thing, not only do you have Word and Excel, or the third thing, I guess, is you have the management of all of these databases, right? So how many people probably use BizComps or IBA, or you want to, you know, fold in RMA, et cetera. You want to do all these analyses. Well, each time you do that or pull that data, you know, if you don't have the unlimited uh, license from RMA and, and, and um, the IRS stats and from, from um, uh, BizComps, et cetera, you've got to keep, keep and update all of those licenses all the time. And you know, cash flow wise, it's a it's an annoying because they all expire at different times and different dates, and they're never in sync. And sometimes you think, well, I want this one, but not that one. Or I'd really like to have the benefit of these, but is it worth the expense? And so again, not only do you have that, but then you have to integrate this your Excel documents with all of the comps, and then update it, and then run the market approach, and then do the market approach. Uh, correctly. I will say on a side note, I, I'm surprised at the number of times people do the market approach inappropriately, that they fail to add back the balance sheet and, um, you know, do the things that are necessary within the approach. And especially people that don't do this all the time, there are little nuances like that, that, that you forget about, or you, you think, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot to do that, that piece of adding back the balance sheet um, as it relates to to the uh, market approach in this instance for these types of companies. And, and so when that happens, it just, it starts to erode your credibility and um, th then your numbers are off, right? And so, so heaven forbid you rely on the market approach and do the methodology incorrectly. Um, that's not a good place to be. Well, this software doesn't allow you to do that. It, it knows how to do the approaches. And so from a, from a, error protection slash looking over sh your shoulder perspective, you're kind of rock solid here to use the software because you, you, you are dialed in to the right way to do all the different calculations, okay? So let's, let's talk about this a little bit. And I'm gonna show you a specific example and something that I really like, a feature that I really like is called the discount for lack of marketability feature, DLOM. I really like how it, how this works and, and show you how it integrates into custom schedules that uh, we use. In fact, this is a one that I just I scrubbed uh, from just the other week. So so with that, do we have any any kind of questions or anything uh, before I start to get get dialed in here? I don't see any, but let me just check. Really no, there's no questions yet. Okay, thank you. So if we look at this software, and what I have dialed up here is uh, one of the examples that they have within Value Source, and it's a darn good example. And what this is is a children's clothing store. And you start to set up, you know, the analyses over here. And what you can see here is that this looks like Excel because it, it is Excel. So we're sitting on top of Excel with a piece of software that in essence is going to integrate the stuff that we have in Excel into Word. Okay, does that make sense? So we're going to start the funnel with the data that we would normally do. And I would say almost all the time we start, you know, all of our business valuations, we start with Excel and we start with questions like, um, you know, we need the last five years of financial statements. We need the last five years of tax returns. We need, you know, some data about compensation, those sorts of things. And then once we have that package, then it's fairly easy to hand it off to a staffer or for you to, to enter this data into the software itself. And as you can see here, we can come up with the business names, child's clothing store, the short business name, this this is in blue, so it automatically pulls this information. Uh, we have the business address, the state, the, the, the date of the valuation itself, the state that it's incorporated, and just some other good data that we have here. Number of shareholders, number of shares that are issued, which is 5,000, number of shares being valued, which is 4,000 shares, 
and then the percentage of the business being valued is simply obviously taking the 4,000 divided by 5,000 total shares outstanding to produce an 80% uh, ratio of what it is that we're valuing. The next thing that we can see here is that based on this, <clears throat> we can come in and show the different owners and type this information in and and we can see that well of that 80 percent we're probably we're valuing sally's shares at 80 percent and so we understand that we have some data in here about who the different owners are it'll produce a chart automatically um, based on who owns it that we can copy and paste or, or add into our report writer if we would like okay we also have some some report writer information, which is you know the date of the report, which of course the report date and the valuation date are almost never the exact same date. I guess in theory they could be, but they are almost never the same date. Uh, we can see the premise of value, whether we want to value this as a going concern, uh, what the standard is that we're going to use, and we can we can we can decide what that wants to be here. Fair market value governing standard is fifty nine sixty which I would think most people would understand that to be IRS revenue ruling 5960, which is the hypothetical willing buyer, hypothetical willing seller standard. So we have that in here. The purpose is for planning. We have our appraiser information, et cetera. So, so this is nice because it's a, it, we enter it in one place. We don't have to check 15 other places throughout as to understanding where it is this information uh, is coming from. So we have this all in one place. Federal tax table is automatically entered in here. And then this is kind of the, the, the key. And that is that the next thing we do, which is just like you would do in Excel, we enter the um, balance sheet data. And this looks like Excel. It's very similar to Excel. We can add, we can insert lines, you know, we can change descriptions, etc. The key in here is that, that we want to use the state, although we can write over and change almost anything that we would like in here. The thing that we want to understand is we don't want to delete rows like total assets, et cetera, or we don't want to delete rows like other current asset, or excuse me, like total current assets. Because what that does is what this is doing is automatically starting to set you up for um, calculation later with your ratio. So when we change things within the balance sheets and within the income statements, we want to kind of to make sure we keep the key subtotaling that's in place. And it's going to give us, you know, it's going to automatically help us when we go to start to input RMA and other things so that we have this data in here. Now, the other thing that's nice is, is what it automatically does is if you look over here to the right, and a lot of people skip over this, but it's going to start to give us some color commentary for our writing. I, I noticed that that staff, and, and I do sometimes too, we struggle as to what to write about. Uh, if we're right about the financial state, well, well, here's the historical balance sheet. And we can see that it has a total assets of $3,095,000 for the year ended December 31st, 2018. Well, you know, okay, so what? Um, what we can say then about that is that, that average, you know, the range of and this will prompt us for things, right? The range of the total assets has been from one million five hundred and fifty thousand dollars to three million nine hundred and three million ninety five thousand dollars, with a mean of two million two hundred and seventy thousand dollars and a median of two million two hundred and nineteen thousand. And so we have, you know, kind of some of this commentary. I would say I I probably put a little bit of this stuff in here when we talk about the range of cash. And other important aspects, especially, I, I, I probably generally always co comment on what cash has ranged over the last several years and uh, what cash is average, because I think that that's fairly important to understand and it gives me something to talk about and the receivables, et cetera. Can you build this Excel? Can you build this on your own in Excel? Yep, sure you can. Uh, but I think what you'll start to see is the accumulation of all the stuff that is built is going to make it somewhat overwhelming that you would never build this in Excel because it's taken programmers, you know, 15 years to build this thing to where it is today. And, you know, they, they've spent a lot of time on it. 
but, but could you build something like this, this schedule in Excel? Absolutely, positively, you could. But do you want to spend your time building templates in Excel? And that's, I think, the question ultimately you're going to have to ask yourself. Do you want to build all these templates and manage all these templates, or do you kind of want to have them here for you and then hone in on the ones that you like to use and then pull that out of the software and use it? That's kind of the decision point, I think. Um, again, it's, it's nothing rocket science here. This is just, just five years of history. Um, you can have it go read from left to right or from right to left. I generally like to have, you know, when I build mine, I generally start with the most current year in the first column. And it's mainly because I can match up the words a lot easier. I can see the direct labor. You know, if I come all the way out here, I have to kind of understand is that that's 800. This, this to me is the most relevant column, the 2018 column. And this is the least relevant column, which is the 2014. And, and a lot of uh, auditors like to use kind of the most current thing in the first column. And that's just what I use. It's just a personal preference. Makes it easier for me to see the contributions in the most current year are, should I mean, it's hard for me to figure that out without, well, without this. So the contributions within the first, the most current year are $10,000. And in the least important year that, that, is, that, that I have on here is they are $5,000. So we have that on here. So this is, I'm guessing, 85% of people start with the basics, which is the balance sheet and the income statement. Then the next thing that you can do is you can come in and you can make your adjustments. There we go. And you can make them on a year over year basis. And so if we look here, you know, when we adjust the income statement, of course, you have the adjustments, which gets you to the adjusted financial statements which are probably the statements that you're going to want to use. Okay, In most cases, you're going to use the adjusted statements. But you have in here a little, nice little template to show the historical year um, or whatever the base year is, and then you have your adjustments. And you can see here that two adjustments were made in advertising, uh, and we have an alpha and a bravo footnote here, which talks about insider con an insider contract and excessive expense that were adjusted. And it's pretty pretty simple to use. We can sit, hit the button I just hit was edit adjustments. So you see this up at the top. The difference with this in Excel is you, you, you generally going to look first to see if there's a command up here that you need to use. And then if you hit that, and it'll pop it up. And I could easily make, you know, um, another comment here. Adjustment, 10000 dollars uh, you know cash cash expenditure let's say for something and we can put that in here and we can see that this adjustment is alpha bravo and delta thirty five thousand dollars and we can see that we have our notes down here as to what it is now I like this I think that's very nice it's very clean it's very easy your compensation adjustments all that stuff can be down here you can make the notes as extensive as you want. And the nice thing is it's set this up for, uh, for printing and have kept it in order and has kept track of it. Again, can you do this and build this yourself? Yeah, of course, but, but then you got, you got some work to do. The next thing is this will then take those adjustments and give you the adjusted income statements, okay? And the adjusted balance sheet. So we have all that stuff in here uh, automatically. And so we have all of our, our basic base financial statements uh, already done. Um, there's some other analyses and other things that we can see. We can see summary analyses. You can build custom stuff in here. You can change all this stuff, save it as a template for the way that you like to use it, and then go from there. The nice thing is at the end of this, then it automatically, and, and again, I was saying you want to keep your, your footnotes or, your, or your, your, as you add it within the historicals, you want to save those, those key ratios as it relates to cash and certain other things. But you can see it's going to give you statistics and your common size stuff that, yeah, you can build it. It would be pretty easy, but it's nice when somebody else has already built it for you, okay, and you don't have to. So all this stuff comes in. It's included. Um, you can look at the trends. You know, you look at the trends and the balance sheets. 
You can look at trends in the income statements themselves. Okay, and again, it's giving you this minimum, maximum, mean, median. Again, I like this because it prompts me to think about what it is that I want to say. It can give you the growth rates, etc. I'll tell you what's annoying to me is where I, I pick up points when I'm, I'm on the other side, and that is when people ignore their, their, own, their own data. In other words, if you have a company that has been trending along at a seven or eight or a six or whatever it is percent growth for a period of time, and then you just throw down a, a some number from that you pick from out of the air, you know, that is a, is a problem. So that this gives you data that you can use and look and see what the trends are within the company itself. Okay. Also very nice. And I'm going to show you where I did this, but but see this button. This is the database button. I can click here. I can go into to to whatever it is that I want to do. I can go into RMA. I can choose whatever it is that I want whatever industry that I that, that I have and, and um, fin fish fishing that looks like a really good industry so I can I can, can use this or, or, or use this if I wanted to as my comparison all the different industries are here then I can hit download copy this into the analysis of course, I'm not going to put in flower milling, but 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 what we have entered in here is all of our ratios are now like and literally it's that fast. All of our ratios for RMA are now downloaded into a really nice little table that we can build uh, that is already built for you, and it'll tell you where your company ranks. Okay. Not only that, it's going to tell you the percentile rank. So we're not just saying here's the mean and the median. We're saying, look, you know, like an SAT score, you're in the 80th percentile, you're in the 82nd percentile, you're over the 90th percentile in these particular categories. And 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 so what what you can see is it's really starting to give you some data so that and I hope the point here that you're going to start to understand, and I'll say it two or three times. And that is that you're going to spend more time being an analyst of the company using statistics that are already built in rather than being a person who uh, spends most of their time entering the data and building the model. Okay, so this is going to switch you from being the person that builds the model in Excel to being the person that is taking the model that's built, pulling the data, and focusing on what the data means rather than how to enter the data. Okay, so we can see that it gives us all these ratios. We can see within the appraisal itself. Okay, it's going to give us the the indicated you know book value, which of course is the the um, uh, automatic value that we have. It's going to give us the adjustments to market value. So we have this is our historical balance sheet under the income under the asset approach. The asset approach is basically a, a two-step process. We're going to take the book value, which is the value on the financial statements themselves. We're going to adjust those assets to what their fair market value is, as if they were able to be sold. And then we have the adjusted value here. Well, here we have this. It gives us our balance sheet automatically. We didn't have to go back and create that. We didn't have to copy that tab over. We didn't have to set up the formulas on, on to make the, the adjustment to value. And then it's going to give us our year-end adjusted uh, uh, book value at the end. Okay, so all of this is done for us. If we look at, uh, for example, a DCF, We can put the forecast period and I'll make all these different inputs and, and adjustments, whether we want to use a capital asset pricing model or the build up method. We can change that. We can look at this. Um, it'll give us the, it'll pull the benefit stream that we have. Okay, We can put, put in what the changes to working capital 
changes to um, uh, capital assets or what we think that that is going to be, it's going to automatically pull depreciation in for us and add that back and then um, uh, subtract the capital expenses. It's going to automatically do all of those different things for us based upon how we set up the financials in the beginning. Okay. Can we build this and excel ourselves? Yes, we can. Is that a good use of your time? If that's, I think, the question you've got to start answering, asking yourself. It's going to show us the DCF calculation. It's going to do it correctly. It's going to calculate the terminal value correctly. It's going to apply the proper cash flow in the terminal period correctly. Um, I know lots of times people miss that particular piece of the calculation. Um, we don't have to worry about it. It's all in here. and It's going to give us the value. We, we can input these little blue things here. Um, these, this is the company growth. And this is the discount rate. All these things are entered. Again, we can pull the discount rate automatically because once we enter the NAICS code and, and go out and download the information from Duff and Phelps, then uh, uh, all of that stuff is input in here automatically for us. Okay. The nice thing is, and, and this is the other thing that's really nice, and I'm going to show this, I'm going to go over to the custom, and I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, we, we can look at the conclusion of value here. Now, what, what's nice is, and what you don't see behind the scenes, and in this, this, this period of time, we just don't have time to run through everything the way that I would like to run through it if we had a, two hours to do this. But what I want to show you here is the power of this. And this is that each and every one of these is a separate component of this database and of this you know, really fancy Excel sheet that's automatically calculated. Okay, So we have the book value method. We have the adjusted book value method. We have the liquidation method, cap earnings. Um, DCF, summary, DCF with projections, where you kind of put in your own projections, all different kinds of market data that we can pull in automatically and use to analyze, et cetera. And then over here, we can assign all of these different weights, meaning one, meaning we're going to use it as an equal weighting to, to the value here that's selected. And we don't have to use all of these. And in fact, I, I've never seen anybody use this many of them, right? We, we, this is the demo that has all the stuff where somebody programmed all this stuff in for it, that most we're probably gonna use two or three or four methods. Now, what I like about this is I can run two different market approaches. I can run a rule of thumb value, which I kind of like to run as a gut check. And I can run uh, you know, using two different databases to see if the data comes back at, at about the same point. Um, I, I like that a lot. And then I'll always run, of course, the asset approach. We'll always run an income approach. Now, sometimes we'll run two income approaches. Sometimes we'll just run one. The nice thing is here, I can kind of see what the range is of all the different different methodologies that might be there. And I can also see if, if you know, I want to use these particular ones or not and um, um, go from there. Now, having said that, I want to show you something on the side and I want to show you custom. So this is what rolls out of the software click a button for the report and it'll generate the whole report for you okay with all this data in it now the reason you don't want all these on here is because if you really didn't put a lot of effort in it it'll pull a figure into this whether you did a lot or not because some of the inputs have been filled out but you want to turn off all the ones you don't really consider because it's not more credible in my opinion to have run 19 different scenarios when you really are only considering two or three or four okay so you're going to want to turn off the ones that you don't you really want in your report because you don't want to have to defend four different scenarios or 18 different scenarios you only want to defend three or four now the other nice thing that i really like in this thing is if we come over here we look into the premiums and discounts this has been a focus for the irs and and we can pull this Pluris discount for lack of marketability data. And if you haven't run this, this is, think of this as a market approach to doing the discount for lack of marketability. It's gonna pull in market data. And what this does is this gives you a really uh, sustained 
uh, a fortress to defend your marketability discounts rather than saying, um, you know, the range is is 25 to 45% and therefore I picked 30, okay? Think about this as the, the, the plurus discount for lack of marketability as going out and finding what comparable discounts are for stocks uh, within your, within your uh, either asset range. I, I look at it two ways. One is add by the asset range and the industry and try to find the best comps that I have there. And so then what we do is, is we pull this into our stuff, which is custom, which is really kind of the next level. And so here you can see, this is our uh, discount for lack of control. This is, we've got our own language that we like and the software has its language. I mean, we've taken pieces of that and I've taken pieces from other things. And so we've pulled all this into our own standard language. We have our own scan standard stuff. Like here's, here's the stuff, like a lot of people have this, the merger stat review, control premium data, et cetera. You'll have all that and then you'll talk about the range and then people stop kind of right here. And they'll say the range was blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, ro roll with it from there, okay? Um, that, that is, and I, I'm sorry, I'm on the discount for lack of control. This is the discount for lack of marketability. And, and again, we have these studies and these surveys and we put this stuff in here and then, then we, we, we just spit out a number and that's not good enough for the IRS. What this does is it solves that problem. And it gives us the the uh, data that we have that that it has available, which is the restricted stock equivalent discount. It gives us this range. It gives us these other things. It compares our subject company to the the data that it's analyzing. And this is the key to to winning uh, in court with the IRS or with other people is we pulled our subject company's traits and we compared it to the uh, uh, sample group. And this is where we were. Okay, and these are the weights that we assigned on these things. Uh, here's the discount for lack of, of marketability. You add it up. We put in an additional, we added this little thing, an additional addition, a lack of marketability premium. We will put that in there if we think we need to adjust it at the very end. And then we talk about that. Then, then here's the other piece that people don't do a lot. And that is, did you go through the shareholder or the operating agreement? And did you look at that and did you find the, the notes of restrictions in here? So we'll go through, we'll pull all of those restrictions about the lack of ability to sell the share. And then we have the final lack of marketability, which is 25%. But in this place, we calculated it very conclusively. Okay, so we have all that stuff in there. And that's, that's kind of how we do it. And we use this and we like it. The other thing that I have to, would say that I found is, is we're doing more and more uh, Gift tax returns, those are those are kind of coming back into vogue. We generally do those on a 1% or a per share interest. And that is because then the attorney can mix and match and do whatever it is they want with those numbers. Okay, so, so if they're given 13% or 33%, we'll say that this 1% value or this per share value is good for a transfer up to, you know, 34%. And then that allows the client to mix and match and, and do whatever it is they want when they know they just can do some very simple math on it. So that is what I have. And I do want to open this up to some, some questions. Um, does anybody have any questions about how this works or the software? Okay, somebody has this, they, have a, they want to do simple valuations, quick and dirty valuations. Here's in their business brokers. So, so business brokers, quick and dirty valuations. What's cool about this is, is um, you're going to be able to pull that data really quickly. So I, when I talk to people who want to know what their company is worth without doing a full blown valuation, I'll just go click, 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 click. I'll pull down the market data that's in there. Uh, I look for the outliers and delete those before I hand it to the, to the client because I, you know, like, like if, if, if the range is, you know, we all have bad data, right, from time to time under the market approach. So if there's something in there that says the company's for whatever reason sold for 111 times revenue, I'll delete those because that's the, what the one transact comp that the 
client will focus in on, but it gives you within a very short period of time, a really nice uh, um, uh, snapshot of what, of setting client expectations. So I like to pull that. And I also like to pull the industry data and send both of those to the client in that kind of situation. So what sort of disclaimers does a software friend? I, you know, I, you have your normal disclaimers uh, as it relates to, you know, we assume that all the assets are owned, et cetera. I don't know that the software itself really gives you any, the um, claims against its performance, um, but it gives you the normal stuff that we all use. Do we need to have any professional designation to be able to perform valuations? That's a really, really good question. So, um, no, you don't have to have any, any designations, but then at the same time, your report can't represent that you do. Okay. So your report really can't represent that you do. And, um, otherwise you can run this. There's nothing that says you, you're not, there's no, not like a driver's, you know, not like you have to have a driver's license to rent to, to drive a car. This you don't have to be licensed, but but make sure you're not holding yourself out as being licensed. Any other questions? I'm kind of well. If there aren't any, oh wait, software require constant um, to updates to function, or can a company buy a standalone license and use that version for five years? Um, that's a great question. And yeah, I used to not update it for the very reason that it was kind of, that you know, funds were tight in the beginning when I started out. Uh, and it still worked just fine. I mean, what's gonna, what you're not gonna have is, you know, those databases are gonna expire on a year over year basis. So, you, you know, if you're, if you're, if that is an issue, then and you're not doing a lot of them, then then you know you're going to want to get the software, and then then maybe, uh, uh, but the software will continue to work. But but uh, um, well, Frank, let me chip in here. This is David. Yeah. Um, after Microsoft changed their licensing requirements, we only sell this on a subscription now. We used to sell okay. it standalone. So these days, you have to buy an annual license, which you can pay for monthly or you know one time. Okay, but the software itself is very. If that was a change. I know in the beginning, I I didn't get the updates at the beginning, except every other year because I uh, I just was starting out. And um, but no, I mean you, you're going to have the benefit of being able to be to be much more productive and move a lot faster, and get out of the business of doing um, uh, building Excel sheets and get into the business of doing the analysis. And overall, it's much cheaper than going out and trying to buy all this stuff somewhere else, you know, trying to buy all these databases and RMA, et cetera. It's, it's a huge cost savings as it relates to that. 